right. Uh, at least someone far left on a good mood. <laughs> hey, we're having a good time today. That's all I got to say about having a good time. <laughs> Phil. Yes, sir. What's going on, brother? <laughs> Nothing much. I'm having a great day. It's another day in Jersey, right? Another day in Jersey. <laughs> it's 70 degrees uh, two days ago, and now it's, I think, 35. <laughs> so. So, so. So, Phil, we got, um, we got a little bit of history together. I've known Phil now for a few years, and um, I've watched Phil grow his isogenic business. He's over the top 200 people in a, a company that's over several hundred thousand people strong. He's also a, a master ninjutsu a MMA fighter, um, participates in competitions and trains a lot of kids and has a program as well where he helps out women with the self-defense side of things, uh, which I remember we sat down over two years ago and talked about you wanting to do and now you're out there doing it and helping people. So I just first of all say, you know, congratulations for going Thank out you. and achieving your goals and, and uh, you're about to go surfing finally. Mr. Yes. yes, the one thing we talked about, we kept bringing up. It's yeah, a, man. The one thing, the last thing on my, well, not the last thing, but the one I always wanted to do. Yeah, and the, the one of the things is, is Phil is uniquely, um, you know, equipped with is just having a heart of a lion, you know, coming from the aspect of being a police officer. Uh, he worked in the, the New Jersey uh, Police Department right outside of uh, New York City. Um, you know, and, and tr had tremendous experiences over there on the traumatic side of things. And uh, I think one of the podcasts I listened to you were doing with Andy, actually, about how you went into the burning building were helping that guy. I mean, just left me on the edge of my seat. Can you just tell that story? Just to, to, I just yeah, love sure. to talk about that. I was on the job. Uh, I worked in a small town. Um, I was on the job for, I just passed my probation. So it was probably a probation is a year. So probably a year and a half. And, um, we got a call of uh, smoke coming from a building. Now, it, it was downstairs. An elderly man lived downstairs, a World War II vet. And um, he lived downstairs, and he, he fell asleep on the couch with a cigarette. And it was that old type of couch where the black smoke, when it, when it burned, came up the steps. And that smoke is the one you inhale, and it's just, you know, uh, you can't breathe. I mean, you can't breathe any smoke and fire, but this one was bad the chemicals from the, the, the couch. So then the ceiling caught the whole place was engulfed downstairs. So they always tell us, firemen tell us, and, and you know, superiors, don't, don't go in. But as cops, I never met a cop or worked with a cop that would never, ever, ever go into a burn, not go into a burning building to help somebody if they can. So we go into the side and I open a door and just black smoke came out, you know, flames, and I see an elderly man, and he was heavy. He was over 300 pounds. And I, I, I think quickly thought, like, I can't pick him up. My sergeant was a little older. And the other guy I worked with uh, was, was a big guy, too. So I said to myself, uh, you know, I was pretty in shape. I always stayed in shape. I said, if I wedge myself underneath him, I could, like, shimmy him up. And the guys with me can, like, under, hook me underneath and help me up each step. So what I did is well, I went underneath him. And um, I didn't know this, but he suffered from uh, severe depression. And uh, he sat on top of me and said, uh, I said, you know, I want to save you. I said, come on, let's go. You have to help me here. I said, because the flames were coming up. And he's like, I just want to die. And I said, I'm not going to die. I said, you know, I'm not dying today and neither are you. So each step, each step, it felt like an eternity. Each step, they pulled us up, pulled us up. They got us out. And... Um, I went to the hospital for smoke inhalation, you know, minor burns. I mean, but it was this close. I mean, the whole basement was, was, was gone. They had to remodel the whole thing. And, um, you know, my brother officer's there to help me, but to, to, you know, I just, it just didn't think just to go underneath him and help him out each step, each step, each step, you know, got him out. And, uh, he was over, he was about 320 and I was maybe 210, 205 at 61. So, so basically, I, he he crawled up me, basically. So, and I was able to get him out. And uh, you know, I got an award for that. And um, that was that was really I was very proud. Uh, not the fact that I got him out, uh, just the fact that 
my brother officers were there, you know, that I was alive. You know what I mean? I didn't consider myself a hero. I was just doing, like any cop says, I was just doing my job. You know what I mean? I was just doing my job. I, I, and, and I know any other cop would have done the same thing. And um, I got there and, and I, you know, I was in, you know, the fireman told me you shouldn't have went in. I was just like, I'm not, that's not, that, that's not an option. If I can go in, I'm going to go in because, you know, it, it's a part of you. It's, it's hard to explain. Now that I retired after 13 years, people ask me, you know, are you, do you still miss it? I say, yeah, I miss it. It's, it's, it's who I am. It's a part of who it's, you know, it, you know, not everybody runs into a burning building. Not everybody does a, this runs towards shootings. It takes a certain person to do something like that. And, uh, you know, I was, I was very proud of that. Proud of, proud of the guys that I work with. You know, we all work as a unit and, uh, we do did our jobs last night and that night and saved his, uh, someone's life. Now, Phil, one of the one of the concepts we have in the Marine Corps is you never leave a Marine behind, and I, I believe that's exactly the type of atti- attitude. I mean, here it is. You know, most people, if they see a burning building, obviously they're not thinking, "I'm just going to go run into it." You know, and and you've you've always had this thing about you about being a like a, a savior in a way. You're always looking to help people. Put yeah. yourself out there and I've, I've seen you do that from from time to time again reaching out to people uh trying to help them and even do, donating time for fellow officers to talk about things that have actually happened what where did that come from for you i think that was instilled in um when i was when i, when I was younger i was always uh, uh willing to help people you know what i mean i always i always tapped in other people that were upset and i always want to know why you're upset like what's wrong you know what I mean? And, and anything I can do to help you, even as a kid, you know what I mean? A kid walks in, he's upset. Say he's a new guy at school and he comes in. I remember this in third grade, new guy at school, head down. And, and, and I walked with him the whole day of grammar school just to make sure that he was all right. And I remember, you know, and I think it's something that's just instilled in, in you. And it was through my family values too, that we're always help, always help people. And everybody in my family is the same way. You know, my sister, Alexis, uh, who's uh, the top in our company um, helped people on our team become uh, millionaires. And she loves, I said to her, you could leave this and not do this. And she said, but I won't because if I did, how would anybody else underneath me be financially free? And I was like, so I knew that it was a part of who I, you know, my family and a part of my DNA to help and my cousin was a police officer and um so i i i believe that that that's that's what it was from when i was a kid and then when i was on the job it, it was even more you know you know what i mean even more you were, i know you did really well in school and you were like val victorian and things of that nature right <laughs> But as, as my as my daughter mentioned about what's dismissal and you're like i was gone way before that right you, you, you know what it was like i <laughs> like I told you, I, I, I teach jujitsu and uh, I, uh, I've been doing it. For, I've, been, I've been training for 15 years. It's a huge part of my life, martial arts, as you know. And it was because I almost got triangled on a microphone wire my first year on the job when I worked by, on the boardwalk. And uh, just, just school, not that we didn't need school. It was just, uh, I was always, and I remember. And I told this to you, I remember looking at math class and not having any idea what's going on on the board, but wondering how the board was made. So I used just a different part of my brain. So I said to the lady, she's got ADD and all, and all this stuff. And I said, I said, they said I had ADD. I was like, I think I'm a pretty good listener because I've been doing this for 16 years. <laughs> I said, so I think I listen pretty well. And she's like, you know, you're right. So I, I just said, you know, he, he just created it's, really, it's creative, very creative. You tap into that creative part of your, your brain, which you've helped me to do. And I didn't say this when you first uh, opened up, but I, I appreciate everything you've done for me because so. you opened my eyes to a completely different world. And you, yeah, you made me tap into the part of my brain, which made me think growing up that there was something wrong because I was thinking, like I said, looking at the math board, like, how is that made? Or like, my creative side and I I would get yelled at but before they would yell at me they would look at my picture and I would draw and they would be like 
And they would look at the paper and they'd rip the paper off and bring it next door to the art teacher. <laughs> so I didn't get in trouble. I got to go to art. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was that, you know, creative and I just wouldn't, didn't sit still. I was always wanting to, you know, do something, you know, create something. Yeah. I think if we're in the same class, you've been sitting in the back of the class with me. Yeah. So, I was, well, you made me turn my desk around. Yeah. <laughs> But so so cool. Creating stuff together all day in the back of the class. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I was at the wall. I stood at the wall. <laughs> I I got but. I got my first grade teacher, Miss Johnson. I'll never forget this. I was got in trouble because I was creating things in my desk out of like glue of all play things, right? Yeah, make, making characters. And um, <laughs> so she says to me, she says, "You're disturbing the class." I'm like, I don't, I don't see what I'm doing. I'm not talking to anybody else. I'm just kind of screwing around my desk. My but, <laughs> yeah, my own little world. What, why, what does that have to do with with you? And and uh, she's like, "Well, I'm going to put you in the back of class." I'm like, "Oh, that's perfect." I was like, "I just get away from everybody. I don't want to deal with anybody." So she puts me in the back of the class, and, uh, and I'm, even, I'm, I'm like 20 feet beyond. Like, I mean, it's not that big of a classroom. I'm, way in the back in the play area, right? Now, which is, I think it's great, you know, personally, because when they go for recess or whatever, I'm right there on the toy, so I can get them right away, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, <is> <laughs> so she says, uh, she says to me, um, I think it was, my parents went in for, uh, uh, I think it was, what, what was that? Like teacher night or something like that? Parent teacher? Yeah, parent, yeah, parent teacher night. Yeah, so she says to, my mom comes home that night, and she says, she, she's like, oh, well, I noticed because your, your teachers, your, your, your parents sit in your desk, right? So all the other parents are sitting up in the front of the classroom. And here's my parents sitting in the back of the classroom, right? Yeah, go, go figure. And uh, so she says to me, she's like, did you want to sit with all the other kids? I was like, no, I like it in the back of the classroom. I was like, it's the lady doesn't bother me, you know? I was like, I'm getting good grades and everything like that. What, what do you care, you know? Uh, that's my yeah. thought process as a first grader. It hasn't changed, yeah. right? No, no, no. It, and I find that a lot of times entrepreneurs, we've got these superpowers. Sometimes it's dyslexia. Sometimes it's, people like to say ADD, right? Whatever, you know, whatever they want to label as, right? I mean, it, I don't have a, a, what are those called? Ridlin, uh, like deficiency. No, I've got the ability to create, you know, and, and like a lot of other people, they can't actually go out and do those things. So I, I find that a lot of entrepreneurs are like that, that fit in the same shoes. So I think that's one of the reasons that you and I connected together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when we connected, the way we connected together was just, it wasn't an accident. And I believe that 100%. And um, like I said, every every child that I teach in jujitsu, I tell their parents they're gifted in jujitsu because like I took it to another level. And once you pass another level after 10, 12, 13 years, we're all alike. And we, we share stories and I'm like, it's like looking in the mirror at the same guy, you know, we're all alike because you know, we found something that we love and we went right for it. And, you know, there was no holding us back. And I believe that with entrepreneurs, you find it, there's no holding you back. Like you said, heart of a lion, there's nothing stopping you. Sleep. <laughs> I sleep on my desk. <laughs> I'll sleep when I'm dead. That's my only thing. Yeah, I didn't want to say yeah, but you know, yeah. And they say the, the, the most... Um, the most wasted town is in the cemetery. It's true. Right, that's where all the dreams are. Yeah, wherever. Yeah, and uh, where? Yes, where are you? Uh, people at their last hour. I. Why didn't I do that? Why didn't I go for that dream? And I. You know, I've always wanted to teach jujitsu, and 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 I am. And I, and that's what I uh, told the parents one day at promotions. And I, and, you know, got a little choked up. There was a hundred of them there, and I turned around and I said, "I want to thank you for." giving me your child for that hour. And I turned to them and I said, I want to thank you for letting me give you my passion and teach you my passion for that hour every, every other day or whatever, how long it is. So it's, it's cool. No, that's, that's huge. Um, yeah. so, so Phil, what are some of the biggest, you know, lessons you've learned along the way a little bit in entrepreneur journey? I know it's not all been peaches and gravy. How did you get from being a police officer to what you're doing now? Um, I worked on, in Seaside Park, which is a small town in a, well, it's not a small town. It was hit by Hurricane Sandy and it became really famous. And um, from that show, it became famous. I, I forget what it was, but that reality show on MTV. Jersey, it, uh, Jersey Shore? Jersey Shore, yes. Yes. So I, yeah, I, I used to have to walk with them. <laughs> so I, I started there. 
and uh, they they liked me there. And uh, I was I was I was like, how could you not? So I said, they they kept me for the winter time, uh, and and the full time guys. It was small town. There's only like eight of them, but they well, would you keep got, you on the Jersey Shore. That's what everybody went, really wants to know. Yeah, I was on the Jersey. Sh- was I on the Jersey Shore? No, the TV I, show. Uh, no, 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 I, no, I, I, I would walk, I was, when they came to Seaside Heights, they worked, when they came to Seaside Park is when, uh, you know, we would walk, but they wouldn't walk too far into Seaside Park, there was really nothing there, but um, for them to do whatever they did, but in uh, Seaside uh, Park is where um, I, I learned a lot about being a cop, I, I you know, where I, I formed that bond, uh, you know. And then I went to a, a smaller town, and um, about a year, two years into it, a situation occurred uh, where I had to uh, testify against one of my own, and uh, that was a nine-year ordeal, uh, over a nine-year ordeal, and it was uh, it was tough. It, it was the toughest thing I ever did in my life. I, I, I mean, I can't, I didn't. I tried to think like, what was the, this is the worst thing ever because. You know, I, who was I to turn to? I couldn't turn to my other brother, officer, and and I can't say I can't blame him because he didn't want anything to do with it. They don't they don't know what happened, and it's just like everybody's just stay away. So like I'm like that lost puppy dog for nine years. You know what I mean? Still answering calls, but you know, and uh, but the guys were good. They they were they weren't bad to me. You know what I mean? They they were good guys, but, but you know, to take to take the stand against one of my own was the toughest thing I ever had to do in my life. And, uh, and to look at him and, and he was my partner, you know what I mean? I, I, I fought with him, you know what I mean? I, I would, I would, I take, I would take in gold for him. And, uh, unfortunately, um, something happened and, and I had to do that. And, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm writing a book about it. It's, uh, it's called, uh, um, I'm, I'm losing my brain here. <laughs> um, I was about to ask. Uh, my broken, my yeah, uh, my my uh, my broken badge uh, uh, is the name of the uh, book. Um, I picked that because um, because of, of of what I went through, and and I felt you know my badge to me meant everything. You know, to me being a police officer meant everything because I had brothers that brothers die in that uniform, and. Um, and I think that, you know, through not being able to talk to anybody, um, you know, me personally, I mean, I, I, I went, went through a very, very difficult, difficult part of my life where, uh, you know, there was some self-medication uh, so I could make it through. And, um, you know, I don't blame anybody but myself and take responsibility for that. That was the first thing I did. And um, after that, I... Uh, chose to retire because I thought that was the best thing for me to do. And, um, I'm still friends with, with um, the cops that I worked with, um, today. I still talk to them. I'm, I'm full, I'm, I'm retired. Um, so I went there, uh, not too long ago to get my ID and I, I give everybody a hug and I said, I, uh, you know, it's, it's all good guys. I, you know, I love you all and I'm here for you no matter what. And, and, and uh, I uh, stay safe. And uh, not too long ago, I think there was a shooting there and I was the only re- first, uh, the or first retired officer to call to make sure the guys were okay. So, you know, there's, there was never ever any hatred in my heart. And, and uh, now four years later, almost uh, three and a half years later after retirement, I knew that this was meant to unfold the way it did because, um, the person that I used to look through a jujitsu to a, through a Taekwondo studio and, and look at, at this guy teaching jujitsu. And uh, this is when I was, you know, so into jujitsu. It was part of my, such a part of my life, which it still is. And I said, you know, wow, I would love to do that. And it just so happens that four months ago when I was te- uh, teaching, um, the guy asked me where I worked and I told him, he goes, I used to work there. I said, really, where'd you work? He said, I worked at, at a Taekwondo studio. And I taught jujitsu there, and I was like, and I, it, it was I, I had to step off the mat because I was so taken back that, I mean, if the, the universe isn't telling me that you're in the right spot and you're doing the right thing now, that you know maybe you you had to go through pain and, and anguish to help to also to help other police officers because, you know, 
there's no brother left behind is what I say, because there's a lot of police officers out there dealing with mental, mental uh, health issues that aren't being attended to correctly. And, you know, it, it, the, who do they call? You know what I mean? Who do they talk to? If somebody like their sergeant and you're out, you're, 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 you know, you're considered, you know, uh, you know, stay away from him, that type uh, of stuff. But, you know, so basically, that's that's like my one of my um things that i want to do is is uh uh maybe maybe i'm not sure yet there's a, there's a an organization that does help police officers that are going through this but i don't you know in the future not maybe not right now but you know the book i do want to write to to to, to help other police officers in this, that are going through this kind of stuff because it's like a lot of people don't think that if you're home and you're, you know, you get into a fight with your wife, a domestic, before you leave the house to go to shift, and then you see five domestics, you're constantly reminded of what's going on with your life. Or if you see a child that's hurt, God forbid, you're constantly reminded. If you have children, then you're reminded of those children. You know what I mean? So it's like people don't really think that. They, they think about, uh, and I'm not saying anything bad about the public and police officers, but, you know, they remember a lot of people remember the ticket they got, and I was one of them until I until I until I saw what was going on, you know, with uh, my own life and the situation that I was involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Phil, I, you, I first of all, I commend you and, and thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, um, and it, it means a lot hearing you say that because I remember a guy that sat in front of me two years ago that couldn't put two sentences together. <laughs> right and, that was and, me, I, that was me. Right, I, I, and just to see how far you've come and and I, I remember you know talking about one of the things you wanted to have happen was that you wanted to be able to share your story with the world and you wanted to be able to be fine with just answering any questions under the sun um you, you've had people come up to you at events that have heard your story and have been touched by it and what's actually happened and transpired you've helped I don't know how many people save lives. Tear, they care a 320 man, a person out of any house is, let alone a burning building. You know, I mean, to, to tell him that, listen, you're not dying today on my watch. You yeah, know? yeah, yep. That's just tremendous. That was just, that was just one. <laughs> that was, <laughs> was just one. one. Yeah. There was, there was, there was get more. So. No, there was, there was, yeah, there was there was, pounds. no, no, there, was, there wasn't a lot, but there was, there was, a, there was, there was a few and, um, and I'm proud of it and I'm proud of the guys I worked with, uh, every, every single one of them. What, what do you feel has been the biggest, you know, shift for you, uh, in the last few years? What have you done that somebody's out there and they want to be an entrepreneur or they want to go down the road that you've actually gone? They've, they've, they've had some things happen to them. They want to bounce back. What would you recommend to them? Don't ever stop. The only way to quit is, is to stop. If you, you keep moving forward, because you're, you're not, you're not going to, and I hate, I'll be the first one to tell you, you're not going to succeed the first time out. It's going to take a step. It's going to be, it might fail. You know what I mean? You, you, we call them wall kicking moments, right? You might have, you might have a ton of them and you might just say, you know what? This is not for me, but deep down in your heart, you'll know it's, it's for you. Because if you have that instinct, that me and you have, you you know it, you know it deep down, you know what I mean. So don't don't ever 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 give up. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up, and 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 know that your vision is 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 so powerful. And like the way you've told me, you know, when we, when we were together, my vision came true. Three years later, everything that I told you happened. I remember I calling you and say, Daryl, everything you've told me is coming true. Like it's happening. It was, it was like, an, like, I'm like, it's like an outer body experience. Like I'm waking up. And at that, at that time I came to you and, 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 and in all intents and purposes, I was broke, as I would say, inside. And, uh, you know, you put the pieces together for me and, you know, forgiveness and, 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 and everything else. And, uh, you know, what you, what you made me see was that every day, on this earth is a gift and entrepreneur wise is that never ever give up never give up you keep going for your vision and 
if, if, if you do not stop and you believe you have that unwavering forgive, uh, b- uh, belief system, like you used to say, um, it'll come true. And then you're going to sit there saying, like I did on the plane and, you know, flying places first class and how did I get here? Like, you know, I, a year ago I was in court, I mean, four years ago I was in court, I, you know what I mean? I was, I was at home feeling sorry for myself and, and, and now I'm all, I'm all over the country with my family, you know what I mean? And, and we're all, we're all flying together and we're all, we're all at the same hotel together four times a year. We were training together and, you know, we're selling the same pro- same health and wellness product together that are making people uh, financially free that were maybe don't like their job and they think this is life, but that's not it. That's not life. It doesn't have to be life. You can create your own life. What you've, what you've done, which you've assisted me in, in numerous ways, I've created my entire, my entire life. And that's what people think that I have to go to work. I mean, that, and I'm not saying if, that, if that's what you want, go to work, have a family, but people that are lost, they say, I'm, I'm stuck. No, you're not stuck. You need to get up. You need to. You need that unwavering belief system that you that you instilled in me, and you need to have the um, the uh, unlimiting beliefs that I, I constantly tell people. Uh, well, this that's, that's an unlimiting belief. What's that? That's an unlimiting belief in your head that you've made up, and it's not true. How do you know that? I said. A wise man told me that <laughs> two years ago, and my everything that's happening to me now is coming true because because of that and my vision that I created and uh, and I can't thank you enough. You know that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, th- thank you, Phil, for sharing that. W- what are some of those? If somebody is not as familiar with like a limiting belief, if you're going to describe a, a possible limiting belief that somebody else has that you've heard whether it's in business, whether it's in martial arts, whether it's being a police officer. I wrote it down because I said it. I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm guilty. I'm broken. I'm lonely. I'm sad. I'm pathetic. Um, why me? This isn't supposed to happen to me. Those are just a few. I can go on and on and on because I've told, I, mean, I told you, I mean, probably a whole day's worth. <laughs> and that, but then, but then after you do that, I can guarantee you, if you would have cut the tape in half like you told me, and you put on one side, all the if you really, really worked on yourself, and you put on one side the positives, like you told me, I can guarantee you it outweigh the negatives, one hundred percent. If you have the heart of a lion, and you want it that bad, like like they say, uh, Eric Thomas says, if you want as bad as you want to breathe, you will be successful. You will be successful. The heart of the lion, Philip Romano. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I appreciate and, uh, it, man. So if somebody wanted to get more information about you and to learn uh, more about how to, you know, get into what you're doing and, and business-wise and stuff like that, what's the best place for them to, to get in touch with you? I'm on, uh, face, I'm on Facebook, Philip Romano, um, 1L. Uh, and I'm on Instagram, Philip Romano. Um, those are two places you can get me at, and I, I have no problem uh, putting my phone number out there. It's on Facebook, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, and whatever you want, man. That's we'll fine. It it's, my, it's, my business, it's my business number. It's 732-674-3469. Shoot me a text. Uh, you know, I, I also run a health and wellness company. If you're interested in that or anything else, please call me. Yeah, I can't recommend Phil enough, guys. He knows what he's talking about. He was educating me before I got on the call about all this stuff. I'm not- I'm like, you know your stuff. I was like, I'm just over here trying to learn. Be like more like you. <laughs> I, love talk, I love talking. Oh, man. I love it, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for coming on today, Phil. Again, guys. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate Romano. your time. Appreciate, appreciate it, bro. Get in touch with Phil Romano, guys. He knows who he's talking about. He's there to help you. Broken badge. It's going to see you soon. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great day. You're welcome.